So, Togo, thank you very much for making time to share your insights into the future of leadership. But before we go to the future, can you tell us a little bit about your own background? Where did you grow up? So, I grew up in Zambia. So, I was born and bred uh, in Zambia. I was born when my family lived in Lusaka, so right. the capital city in Zambia. And then when I was five, we moved to Ndola, which yeah. is where the Copper Belt region of Zambia is. Right. Um, and I spent my formative years there until 16, and then we moved back um, to Lusaka. So I would consider myself uh, fully brought up in Zambia. However, I have, sp I have spent pretty much every year of my life also visiting Malawi and, you know, being in communion with my Malawian family. So I've right. grown up in both countries, but yeah. So what was your dream, dream career when you grew up? Oh, when I grew up, it's actually, <laughs> this is always an interesting question for me. It's a bit like faith, huh? so the way you, people ask you, so when did you start believing? And I think my, my career has been a bit like that. From as far back as I can remember, I've always wanted to make the world better for people who were less privileged. And I think the roots are because um, I come from a Catholic family and my uh, parents were also Rotarians. So from a very young age, I grew up doing community service and stuff like that. And when I was little, the first career um, I remember, I wanted to be um, the chief justice, you know, to bring justice into the world. I think that was because of my dad, who was a judge at the time. And, you know, when my dad would explain the work of, of, of judges and the judicial system, it all sounded great, in, especially in terms of how it helped, you know, disenfranchise people. But then very quickly, I developed an interest in public health. Okay. Yeah, so a lot of our projects at the church, so the Catholic Church, and also a lot of our projects um, as Rotarian children were around either education or healthcare. So I started to find myself being interested particularly in public health. And I wanted to be a public health official because I thought if I do that, I can greatly reduce um, disease burden, you know, work on things like access to clean water and food security and all of those sorts of things. So yeah, for a long time, I wanted to be a public health official. And I think that's how I started off in med school <laughs> and, as a career. And who inspired you in your early days? Um, in my childhood, I think, I think I have a couple of sources of inspiration. I think one of the, probably the biggest inspiration was just the life of Jesus as taught in Catholicism, you know, catechism class. I was brought up to believe that the highest expression of one's talent is a life of service, right? And obviously that was modeled on, on Jesus and the parable of the talents. I, I'll never forget that as a child. And I, I always joke about this with my friends because um, my friends and my husband are always like, oh, you're, you're always so busy. You should learn to relax. You know, you're busy at work, you're busy at home, and you're always trying to do lots of things. And I often tell people is, you know, I, I think as a child, that parable of the talents that if you don't actually honor all the talents and gifts God gave you by trying to exhaust them, then you've cheated God. So I think for there's a big part of my character that believes that, that I must actually live a life that exhausts everything that I have to give. And I just, right. when I come across something, I just try and do it to the best of my ability. So I think that as a life ethic or an approach to life to say, always do your all. Right. And, and until you truly take the time to discover your all, you'll never know what that is. So I think there's a part of my character that's that. I think a second piece was my father was a very big inspiration to me because he was a very humble man, but a very generous, very service-minded man. Always thought you never had too little to share with others, etc. You know, but also taught me you must always try and learn and understand things, but there's never such a thing as knowing everything because you can never know everything. You know, that that's arrogant and um, etc. So my dad had a massive impact on me. I, I see that especially as a child. And then I think they're historical figures. So my, my family were quite strong Pan-Africanists. So I have grown up, you know, in African literature and, you know, African political history. And I have drawn a lot of inspiration from, you know, African 
historical figures and, and political figures as well. When I think of um, the story of Ethiopia and their resistance to colonization, that was something that was taught in my house, you know, in terms of what it represents um, when I think about some of the socialist principles of um, history, you know, and, and stuff like that. All of that has sort of influenced me. So I would say if I had to big, pick big things, I think I'm influenced strongly by my values, which were shaped in me as a child from my family and my religion in terms of service. I think that's probably been my biggest career influencer is to live a life and career of, of service and service in a way that improves the world for the greater good and, and greater mankind. I've never been interested in sort of accomplishments that are either academic or intellectual. Yeah, I've always been interested in accomplishments that change lives, right. you know, and change the world for, for better. So yeah, that's what I would say would be some of my biggest influences. And Togo, where did you start your career? So I, <laughs> it's always interesting. It, how do you define a career when one goes the academic route, right? So, I would say, I would say my university education started at the University of Zambia, in Zambia. But I would say my career in academia started at the transition from the University of Zambia to the University of Cape Town, because I think. Um, I was actually quite lucky. So in Zambia, in med school, in the early years, you get into what's known as the med quota. Mm -hmm. So you do subjects that are in common with um, other students, mm -hmm. people doing human biology or people doing microbiology, biotechnology, biochemistry. And I stood out like a sore thumb mm -hmm. uh, in the classes of like 120 students because I was the student who was supposed to be in the med quota but was asking all the questions around these molecular subjects because I was fascinated by disease and how it was called and you know molecular biology really fascinated me right. and the professor approached me one day and he asked me you know what do you want to do with your life and I explained to him oh no I'm interested in public health and he, he asked me why are you here because this is med school so I was like well every public health official I know is a medical doctor so I just figured this is the route to it and he's the one who counseled me and said actually your mind is so curious beyond the facilities of this university because often i'd ask him things and i'd want to do stuff but we didn't have the money because my university at the time um wasn't like a very well researched uh, university you know facilities were were low and he advised me and said if your parents can afford to send you to university i think you need to go to university in south africa or abroad because i think your mind is being wasted here you know so that was a moment for me i was like oh okay and then I, I spoke to my dad, and he was very supportive. His thing was, oh, just, as long as you become a doctor of something, you know, that was a big joke, because he had a master's degree, and I'd always said I would get more papers than he had. And then I arrived at UCT, and I think arriving at a world-class institution with a lot of questions that were then engaged, you know, and they had facilities and they were doing research. These were things I used to dream about at my university in Zambia because we didn't have those facilities. It was the first time science and my dreams, actually, I could put names to them. Yeah, or oh, this is called research and um, etc. So I would say my career started there because it was at UCT that I first really encountered the impact that academic research could really have on African problems as worked on by African scientists. You know, I think from some of the poorer countries, these are things you read on the internet, right? Or you see happen there. But it was the first time for me that I'm in Africa, you know, and this is an African institution, but with world-class facilities, and I could actually do this as a career. Right. So that's where the shaping of me as, you know, the hungry, academic um, started and, and I started my journey at UCT to go through right. the motions of the honors and then started the masters um, which I didn't finish I upgraded it to a PhD and then finished my PhD and then started in, in research so I'd say that's where my my career really started right so you became a researcher yes. at UCT yes so I became a researcher at UCT but 
I was always labeled, right? Everyone knew, except me, it seemed, that I'm not a, I wasn't a lifelong academic. Mm. And the reason being is I like to make impact, but I like visible impact, mm. right? And in academic research, especially the type of which I was engaged in, these are long-term studies, yeah? I, I worked on probiotics. Mm. I worked on creating African strains of drought-tolerant maize. So it's the timelines are long before sure. you bring something to market, yeah? Easily 15 to 20 years, mm. right? And in that time, what has to sustain you, right, is, I guess, a belief that you are contributing to the academic, you know, body of thought, right? right? And that, for a person like me, didn't work, yeah. you know? So very quickly, I think in my first year of, of postdoc, and I think, yeah, in my first year of being a, a postdoc, I quickly realized that I needed to find alternative vehicles, perhaps, to have impact. And because biotechnology had been one of my undergraduate subjects, I thought about, oh, maybe I should explore this business, right. or your business world, and maybe yeah. you can have impact even on the issues that mattered to me at the time, like healthcare, education, quicker if, if you went into into business and right. yeah and i wanted to then do an mba because you know an academic huh? from the phd now to go to All business right. do an mba but luckily my husband then my boyfriend uh, he was doing law he'd heard of mckinsey All right. and, and company and as a leadership uh, practitioner yourself you know what they say about synchronicity yeah Absolutely. it just so happened that the first website i went on when he told me about McKinsey and Company, and I had, I had no idea what McKinsey and Company was, I had no idea what management consulting was, but um, we met a friend of his and he gave me the website. When I went onto the website, it just so happened that on the website I landed on, and McKinsey has lots of different websites, the website I landed on, McKinsey was celebrating the fact that they had done the ARV rollout work in Uganda pro bono. Okay. And that topic was such a topic that was close to my heart, right? right? Because at UCT in VAC work, I had gotten involved in HIV vaccine work. My family on both sides, both my paternal and maternal, maternal lines, have been devastated by the HIV and AIDS pandemic personally. So it's something that's very close to my heart. So I was like, wow, a company that does that level of work. And yeah, I just made the decision off of that to say, I'm going to try and go to McKinsey and see if right. I can, you know, create the impact I want on the world there because it's quicker and they work on these big projects sure. that are, you know, focused on causes that are close to my heart. And that's so, when I made the transition from academia okay. to so you management, a management consultant. consultant. Yes. And yeah, that was quite the uh, experience. It was actually, it was actually quite funny. Yeah. My first study. Uh, when I was staffed, the staffing coordinator told me, oh, you know, you're staffed, you're going to go on a project. Mm -hmm. It's in Nigeria. So that was very exciting for me because I was keen to work in Africa. And uh, she was like, it's on private equity. I was like, oh, that's great. You know, so excited. Put down the phone and went to Google because I thought, what on earth is private equity? Because I had no clue, right? <laughs> I'm like a molecular scientist. And it was a, I think it was like an eight week study or so. It was a short study, right? And my work stream was working on you know des designing what's the optimal structure for a vehicle to make these sme related investments across africa in healthcare and what was incredible for me was that in the when you join mckinsey there's um, a few weeks of training right? right the basic consulting readiness it's like one week and then we also went to a, a mini mba McKinsey one and then you're thrown into a study now I'm thinking I have no business background etc they think I can be on a study with private equity and they give me a work stream to figure out what's the best way to shape this fund when you're in it it just sounds ridiculous right because obviously as a PhD you've done many years to earn that credential right and I'm being told now in eight weeks we're going to produce something that's meaningful and it was interesting for me because i went through the process it was terrifying but also exhilarating because through the structure that mckinsey takes to problem solving i actually learned a valuable lesson in life which i keep to this day which is 
you actually don't have to understand everything about a problem to solve it well. You have to understand everything you need to know to make the right decision. And that process repeatedly is what you learn in management consultancy. Right. And that happened for me there. So that's how I made that transition. You know, you're thrown into the deep end, yeah. but the structure and the power of teams mm. was also a lifelong lesson okay. for me. Like I still struggle when I see people who want to work alone mm. by themselves because I've just learned it's the most mm. inefficient way to try to do anything. Mm. You know what I mean? Like there's a person who's an expert in this usually in your context. Is it better try find out who that is? rather than try to be a superstar and then take maybe three or four times as long. You know what I mean? So, yeah, for me, that was a massive life-changing moment to enter McKinsey with what I thought were no skills to offer McKinsey, but actually find that, oh, actually, I just need a brain that's teachable, that has a unique perspective, and I need to bring that to the table in a collaborative way, and we can actually do great work. So yeah, that was that was a big thing for me, transitioning into corporate. So from McKinsey, you went to Epson, right? No, not, <laughs> not at all, no. Oh. No, so while I was at uh, McKinsey, I was there for a long time, over six years, and I had my uh, my daughter, my, my little one, mm-hmm. Awande, and um, I had six months of maternity leave which everyone will tell you is very dangerous, right? For a woman, <laughs> you never want to come back. It's never enough. Oh, okay. <laughs> so by the time I came back, yeah. I just wasn't in, you know, in the movie of the breakneck management consulting life, etc. I wanted, first of all, predictable hours. You know, I was just, I just wanted, I wanted a great job that would stimulate me, but my ultimate priority was to be a present mother. Sure. You know, so at that time, um, I got an opportunity to join Novartis yeah. Pharmaceuticals. Um, and I took that up because yeah. it was a, it's a great institution and they do right. great work, yeah. you know. Um, and yeah, so I decided to join Novartis. I'm still right. here in South Africa, but again, my job was an Africa job. So I, jo- I joined what Novartis um, called at the time the Africa Cluster. And it was really at the time when Novartis was establishing more local presence in its African markets. And they created the Africa Cluster okay. to be part of that. So I joined um, Novartis and I was there for a while, like over three years. And then from Novartis, I joined um, Discovery, right. which is another great um, South African um, organization, you know, really pioneering on a global level, Absolutely. not just an African level, which yeah. was uh, amazing. And yeah, I wasn't at Discovery long, but um, it was such a different experience for me. It was the first time I'd been in a founder-led organization where the founders of the organizations were still in the organization, and that was incredible. Um, And yeah, and they had amazing um, leaders, you know, going toe-to-toe with uh, Adrian Gore and, and, and the other leaders in his leadership team. It was also amazing. Um, and then I joined ABSA from there because I was obviously really attracted to the ABSA possibility to really, right. you know, um, I think most of us who've grown up in Africa, particularly outside of South Africa, have been Barclays babies one time or another. Mm. And I was a Barclays baby in Zambia. Okay. And just the idea that you're taking an organization, Barclays has been on the continent more than 100 years. ABSA is a highly established organization in South Africa and you are trying to merge these two giants Mm. into one integrated pan-African institution that can be part of the vehicles that drive Africa to achieve its full possibility. That for me was such an inspiring and attractive proposition and that's how I landed at ABSA. So today you're in charge of learning and development at EPSA? Yes, so I look after leadership development, I look after learning, and I look after talent. um, Can you maybe share a couple of highlights of your EPSA journey over the last years? Um, It's actually, yeah, I've been there, um, it's like 20 odd months. Yeah. Yeah, first of February will be two years. Um, I think I've had many, I've had bit, many big moments, I, I must admit. I think if I, if I look backwards, I think one of my 
uh, one of my greatest moments was when we established ABSA as ABSA Africa, you know, the separation from Barclays uh, last year when that became, you know, official, um, I think it was in July. And the energy across the organization, yeah, I was privileged to go to some of our different markets and to interact with our colleagues and the energy, the pride, the drive to really turn this institution into a truly pan-African great institution. I mean, that was just amazing. And then when we coined as APSA the phrase Africanacity, it's, I mean, all my friends laughed because, um, so I, about seven or eight years ago, made a conscious choice that I, my entire corporate wardrobe, I turned into African clothes. So that's all I wear. I wear only African uh, clothes. So in the organizations in which I've worked, it's become a bit of a brand, right? So because I had just left my previous organization and I came to APSA when African Nasty came out, so many people flooded me with, oh, that's why you joined mm. for African Nasty, uh, etc. But really, what APSA is trying to accomplish, both in terms of bringing possibilities to life and truly establishing a purpose for the organization that is premised on the abundance right. of talent, you know, the abundance of solutions that exist within Africa, right? That for me spoke to my soul because I've always been about that, right? I think Africans are brilliant and I've come across so many brilliant, uniquely African solutions to uniquely African problems to now be part of an institution that says, this is the premise on which we are going to make our impact on the continent, right. right? We are going in saying African solutions, because Africa is a unique context, require, you know, African problems, sorry, require African solutions. And we are going in with the premise that the solutions are abundant and in the system, and we want to work with the system to bring that to life. Right. So that for me spoke to my core. So I think that just establishing, this is what APSA stands for, this is what APSA Africa stands for, that was a big moment for me. It was like a homecoming. I felt that this really resonates with who I am at my core. And I think if I had to think of one other one is when, when we, one of the things we had to do when we separated from Barclays was establish our own identity, right? Mm -hmm. That includes leadership, for example. We yes. had to establish, this is our leadership philosophy. Yeah, this is the leadership philosophy and these are the leadership behaviors that we believe will help us, you know, bring about the impact that we right. want to bring about um, on the continent and beyond. And we put together the leadership philosophy, we put together the leadership credo, which is what we call our behavioral code, and we established the ABSA Leadership Academy. Right, and, and the ABSA Leadership Academy will be our vehicle through which we drive a lot of our leadership, mm. management, and cultural behavior right. and capability building. And the day that we launched that, um, we held a launch event at our headquarters here in Johannesburg, but we were simultaneously broadcasting across all okay. of our markets right. because we have Workplace, which is like Facebook sure. for, the, for the workplace. We were simultaneously broadcasting across all our markets and we were engaged in an organization-wide dialogue on leadership. Right. And for me, that was like incredible because we were speaking, getting feedback from our colleagues, whether it's from Ghana, Mozambique, etc. We were in discussion about right. leadership and our hopes for leadership, but also a true reflection of this is where we're at, you know, this is what we're struggling with, this is what we need to change. Mm -hmm. And for me, that level of a simultaneous leadership dialogue was amazing because I honestly believe those sorts of things can move mm. Africa. If you scale that, mm. and obviously you can't end in that dialogue, yeah? it has sure. to now move to action. That for me was like a proof point to say, you know, everyone is clear, we're all going in the same direction we have the potential and the possibility to actually do this. So I think, yeah, I think the ABSA Leadership Academy has been a massive highlight, particularly because of 
I have the privilege of seeing people at the beginning of their leadership journeys and at the end, right? Because you go in sure. in the beginning, welcome people, you know, say something inspirational, frame the program and what's expected, and then you come down the line 10 months or 11 months later, and you interact with people, right? And sure. because I spend time with them, I know how they arrived. Mm. Okay? And then at the end of the program, to see them coming up with these great solutions, you know, customer focus solutions, things that have been implemented, apps that are already being built, you know, and I'm like, wow, right? These are people who, when they came in, they barely had the confidence, you know, to say this is who they are, this is what their aspiration is, and now they're standing in front presenting the project right. that they've delivered, and it's a customer solution, and it's in production, you know? That's sort of, for me, I think those are the best parts of my job, when okay. I actually see possibility come to life. That's right. why I always tell people I have the best job. Yeah, because I get to see the before mm. and, 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 and the after. Okay. You know, so yeah. So Those Togo, have been some big highlights for me. Right. So Togo, what is driving you today? That's a great question. I think there are two main things that drive me, right? I think one is I have a need that I can't explain. I don't even know where it starts and where it ends. Like faith, I have a need to make a positive difference in the world with what I have. And, and I mean that in terms of my talents and my gifts, but my possessions and all that. This is who I am at my core, right? And I think, I don't know part of it is born this way versus nurtured. So I have a need to make a difference, right? So I'm driven by a need to make a positive difference in the world. Right. My career journey has shown me the positive difference that gives me the greatest joy is helping people fulfill their potential or to be more than they thought they could be. Right. So I've had the privilege, particularly in management consulting, to do different types of work. Right. So you do financial work, operational turnaround, etc. You do numbers work, etc. But nothing for me is personally as fulfilling as seeing people be able to do more. Right. Right? Knowing that it was always inside them. Yeah? They just needed to be shaped or honed or switched on, etc. Because that for me is infinite. Right? So if I help you reach the next level of your potential, your possibility, what you're going to do with that is infinite. And that for me is amazing and that drives me is that because when you positively impact people the positive impact they can have on the world right. is exponential mm. so that's what yeah i'm driven to make a difference i choose this work mm. because it's the most satisfying for me because it makes me feel like my impact mm. is as abundant as the people whose lives i touch so togo what does the future of leadership mean to you Great question. Um, a couple of things. I think the future of leadership is already here. Right? And I know it sounds a bit of a strange response, but right. I always get interested because when we look at the future world of work and, and all these models and all these predictions, I feel like they're already here. Right? I don't think they are at the scale we want them to be. Right? or as entrenched, but I do think it's important to recognize that when we talk about the future world of work, right? or when we talk about the future of leadership, it's actually already here. Right? And for me, that's an important mindset because I think it needs to set the right um, impetus right. to say when we talk about the future of leadership, we're actually talking about change that's needed now. Right? I'm not describing a model for leaders of in 10 years time i'm describing a model for leaders the type of leadership we need today to make tomorrow even better than what it could be right. so i think about the future of leadership as the type of leader that can help us to get even more out of the world that is evolving in front of us on a daily basis Okay, so that's what the lead, when I have the mental construct of the future of leadership, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a leadership paradigm or leadership model for 10 or 20 years time. 
Okay, so from that sort of um, context, yeah, that's what I mean. So the future of leadership for me is what is the leader that right. we need today to help us mm -hmm. make the m most of today mm -hmm. and tomorrow, right. right? And it's not an individual necessarily, mm -hmm. right? Because I don't think leadership is about an individual, right? Mm -hmm. I think about leadership is a way of being, right? Whether you're an individual or, or, or at scale. Right. Yeah. And what have you learned from your own journey that you consider most important if there's one quality that you consider most important for building future leaders? Looking back over your career and your yeah. own journey. Mm. So I have to pick one. <laughs> one or two. <laughs> one or two. So the, I think the most important quality mm. for a future leader is to have a noble purpose. Right? A purpose that transcends the benefits to the individual. Mm. A purpose that is in service of the greater good. Mm. And that good could be your family, it could be society, mm. etc. But I think leaders in particular, people in general, right? But leaders in particular need to be fueled by a noble purpose. Mm because that serves as the campus, you know, in times of turbulence, it serves as the energy, when, you know, it serves as the source of resilience, etc. I don't think there's anything that discounts purpose. I would mm. choose purpose over intelligence any day, mm. right? So for me, I think my number one, my absolute number one is, is purpose. Right. I think when I think about future leaders in particular, mm. there are two things for me that I think are, are very important now, and we need to pay a lot more attention to selecting for them, but also building them from children, um, from childhood, you know, and, and from the primary school, secondary school experience, etc. not just to try and pick it up in corporate. And I think two of those things, I think the first one is future leaders need to have a different definition of success mm. yeah i think the world of today has no room for hierarchy mm. and for hierarchical accomplishment as one's greatest mm. evidence of success right. i think for a long time if i take the career view mm. if you want, if you're like the ceo or the md of a bank that was seen as the ultimate mm. um attainment career right. achievement and I think we need to redefine that in terms of contribution, right? We need to remove titles and hierarchy from our definition of greatness mm. and great leaders, even within corporate spaces, right. right? And start to talk about greatness in terms of contribution. Because I think if we do that, we will force people to be way more introspective about what is it I have to give Right? So what is my ultimate and maximum contribution, wherever they are, so people can understand like, oh wow, so I can be, you know, a frontline worker, and through my incredible idea, can change the face of this company. Right. And it happened, right? Mm. If you think about SMS, for example, mm. the idea for SMS didn't come from some CEO, you know? It didn't, it came from someone who was customer facing, and it fundamentally changed the world of banking, for example, and retail, you know? And I think if we can start to mold a generation and a people who think about their actualization in terms of contribution, mm -hmm. yeah, rather than hierarchy or organizational right. hierarchy, we get so much more mm -hmm. from our people because they'll be just so much intentional to mm -hmm. say, oh, it doesn't matter what my job is. I just, I want to like do great stuff. Right? right, but of course you have to make that concrete by matching it with rewards and all the other sure. things that incentivize people the other way. Mm. But I think, yeah, leaders of the future in particular need a mindset of contribution, mm. right, as a definition of success, rather than revenue or all the other things that we mm. typically use um, to measure. Yeah. And then the third one, 
which I guess is the last one, because if I if my big three have always been purpose, mm -hmm. a noble purpose, contribution, mm -hmm. right? And then the third one is collaboration, and this is one a lot of people speak about, but especially now we see it a lot where. The world is changing at such a fast pace. It almost doesn't matter how long you've been working. You know, you could have been a banker for 40, 50 years. You're not necessarily the source of the greatest idea, right? In how to leave, how to like lead the bank today. Right. And, and in products. And it's really about unleashing the quantum brain of an organization, mm. right? That's the superpower, right? The leaders that can turn a group of people into a quantum brain where everyone is allowed to show up to the fullness of what they have to deliver and work with that. So not a leader who goes in thinking, oh, my leading is I must come up with a strategy. No, you go in saying, we must come up with the best strategy, right? right? And how do I organize, energize, inspire this group of people to produce the best strategy? But not go in saying, oh, I'm the boss, I've been doing this 15 years, Therefore, I'll get their views, but ultimately, this is what I think. Therefore, that's where we're going. I think the world is not there anymore. I think the world is in quantum human brain right. territory. And for me, that's the thing, is how do we get leaders that are collaborative by instinct? Because they, their default setting is quantum human brain, not directional leadership. Right. For me, those three things are disproportionately important. Now, Togo, when you speak to aspiring leaders, what is it you tell them about social media and how they should handle and navigate social media to build their own leadership brand? Yes. I think there are a couple of things about social media. I think the first one is, wow, you know, what's an opportunity? You know, what's a platform? I think the connectedness that social media affords one you know, for collaboration, for insight, for awareness is amazing, right? So I would say to any aspiring or current leader is if social media is not one of your strategies, yeah, you are walking around a bit handicapped, right? I think social media can be very powerful, positively and negatively, right? right? You can't afford to ignore it uh, either way, mm. right? So I think social media is, is very important because of the network, and it just, it brings you into spaces you would never have dreamed of, you know, right. 10, 15 years ago, when sure. we were, yeah, you know, in, in the early days of my own career, I would never have dreamed that I can, I don't even need to know someone to get a response from them. You know, I'm on LinkedIn, they'll look at my profile, they'll decide if they want to respond, but everyone is within your reach, right? So I think that's powerful, but it has to be structured and intentional to my point and purpose. I sometimes find with young people, they think networking is knowing a lot of important people, mm -hmm. right? And they go around and they'll co like collect all these business cards, but they have nothing to show for it, right? That's not impactful, right? And that's the same thing with social media. Right. Social media engagement needs to be intentional, mm -hmm. right? And it needs to be intentional around helping move you towards achievement of your purpose. Mm -hmm. So you need absolute clarity on what is my purpose? Mm -hmm. What is my contribution? Social, need the, social media helps you connect with people who can help you, who can collaborate with you, but it also connects you with potential consumers, right? Who are the people who can benefit from, from what yeah. I have to offer? So you have to be very intentional about social media, right? And, and I think one of the things we need to do a lot more f with our young people with especially is critical thinking okay. and critical consumption mm -hmm. of social media, mm -hmm. right? Because unfortunately, you know, everyone is an expert, yeah. right? And social media has a lot of those. Mm -hmm. Right. So you also have to be, you know, train your thought to be a critical consumer mm -hmm. of social media and of social contact. Right. Right. You can't just try to connect to any old person. You need to have some level of, you know, accreditation, you know, or how can I put it? You need to be able to pick what is most useful, but also do some curation, you know, like when I accept, I know these days because I get a lot of uh, requests for connection. I just, sure. I connect anyhow. But when people start, you know, in sending me emails, mm. etc., mm. then it's critical analysis. I don't respond to everything, mm. right? But I will look at everything because I right. think that's part of my duty of being part of the network. It's not enough to be in the network and just pick, talk to people only when you want to talk to them, right? You also have to give back to the network. Sure. So I look at all my messages, mm. right? But I won't necessarily respond to all of them because some you can tell, okay, that's a chance. Sure. 
some you can tell it's a student trying to do a survey, etc. But you have to be a critical um, consumer and, and a critical engager within that space. Right. I think that's very important. Now, Togo, if you were to design, and probably you are doing that already, design a curriculum for future leaders, what are the new skills that you would want to factor in? Interesting question. Um, I won't, so I won't answer in terms of only skills, eh? because I think you need skills, you need capabilities, but you also need habits, right? I think habits are as important as, as skills. Right. Okay, so if I talk, if I think about some of the work we are doing and uh, or in the process of building um, and my own personal views, I think self-leadership is even more important, mm -hmm. right? And the two aspects for me are purpose, mm -hmm. I'll go back to purpose, and I'll go back to being an intentional personal learner. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is when you are, as your life gets more complex, yeah, like even my own, I'm not, I'm not at the top of an organization, but already I have quite a lot of complexity in my daily life. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to get lost in just living your life, mm -hmm. right? And you can actually lose the anchoring mm -hmm. of your purpose mm -hmm. and also the anchoring of your intention and, and what it was you want to contribute. Mm -hmm. And you just start like drifting, you know, living in drift yeah. rather than actually owning the journey. Mm -hmm. right. And one of the simplest but hardest things to do is to lead the daily life of reflection, mm -hmm. learning, and intentional action. Just that little cycle. You know, and the higher up you go as a leader, the harder it becomes mm -hmm. because there's always pressure, etc. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do that and if you don't build that as a lifelong habit to say when I every day mm -hmm. I will reflect on my day, what is my personal effectiveness? Mm -hmm. Right? What did I do great? What didn't work so great? How can I invite input or viewpoints? and the next day be purposeful about being different, it will never happen. And if the world is changing at such a fast pace, right, you should never be okay being the same person. Right. Right? But if you're not intentional about having those checks with yourself, mm -hmm. right, and re, you know, purposing or reskilling yourself with whatever the new thing is that you need, it will never happen. Mm -hmm. You know? So it sounds funny and it sounds simple, but it's not simple. That's why I said habit. Right, so for me, have a purpose, mm -hmm. but reflective action as a habit, as a leadership habit, mm -hmm. is incredibly important, particularly if you're living in a time of such constant change. Mm -hmm. Right, is get into the habit of reflecting on how you showed up and how you could have been better, and then be intentional the next day about being different. Right, so this is something that we are, you know, it's, it's ancient wisdom, right? But it's not scaled in many organizations, right? Otherwise, you know, tons of organizations would have thriving learning sure. cultures, yeah. right? And we're now trying to do the work of how do we turn this into a muscle yeah. at scale, yeah. right? Where people go through, you know, they do the exercises, yeah. they connect to their purpose, right? But what, how do you then translate that into, no, it wasn't just a great workshop experience. This is how I live and show up every day. And oh, by the way, this is what we're all doing every day. So we are all consciously on a daily basis, trying to be the best version of ourselves, mm -hmm. you know. So for me, that's a, a very big one, mm -hmm. particularly with the constant bombardment, media, always on, no. etc. right? So, yeah. Since you mentioned bombardment, obviously, <laughs> obstacles are a law of life. Yes. You have to, especially as a leader, you have to get used to and get into the habit of overcoming obstacles. Yes. What is it you tell aspiring leaders? How should they handle obstacles in their life? How should they handle obstacles in their leadership? And what are the pitfalls of leadership they should be aware of and almost anticipate in their leadership journey? Yeah. So if I had to pick one thing hmm. uh, that I learned in my own personal mastery journey quite early on from my McKinsey days, which I stick to till today, is that I can't even remember who coined this. But it said, in every upset is a set up for learning. All right. Okay? Same words. Mm. Right? Every upset yeah. is a set up 
for learning. What that has taught me as a practice is whenever something happens to me, I play the part in it. It doesn't matter how negative, you know, how much of a victim I think, I play the part in it, right? And the learning when something happens is why did this happen? Right? So when, when, you, when you take a frame in life to rather than fixate on what has happened to you, right? Think about why it happened, right? What could be the learning and how can you set yourself up from that? So I don't dwell in um, problems. Right. I dwell in the opportunities. The lesson. The lessons within the problems. And sometimes those are lessons for myself. Sometimes they're lessons for the system. Sometimes they're lessons for others. But I don't think any crisis is ever wasted. Wasted. I don't think any problem in life is ever wasted unless you let it. Right. So that's one of my big one is framing. How you frame the experiences you have and the role that you play in it is also very important. Right. If you're being bullied by someone. Right. What's the learning for you in there? Right? You need to interrogate yourself and say, what about me is attracting this person right? to visit this behavior on me? There's a le lesson for me. Right? But I also need to look at the other person. Right? Why is this person with this behavior, which I don't like, being put in front of me? Is there not an op a leadership opportunity? Maybe part of my role in this drama is to be part of their transformation. And this is not about me. It's about their growth. I just happen to be the vehicle that was chosen, right. therefore how am I going to show up mm. to be part of their learning as well as my own, mm. you know, as an example. So for me, every upset mm. is a setup for learning. Life can either happen to you or for you. Right. Right. Yeah. That's what so I would Tomo, say. So as a leader to future, sorry, as a mentor to future leaders, um, can you maybe share a success story or two? Where you mentored somebody and that person took your advice to heart and uh, made some impact. Let me think. Um, okay, so I just try. I'll try and do this in a way that doesn't identify. Sure. Um, the the individual. I think recently, um, in one of the organizations I worked with, I had come across someone who had an administrative job, right? But as I interacted with her, I was struck by how brilliant she was, right? So I had a conversation with her to say, you know, why, how did you end up in this role? Because when I speak to you, I feel you have so much to offer and, and now you're like a paper pusher, kind of just help me to understand um, how you got to this place. And um, we started chatting and then obviously people make sometimes economic decisions, yeah, to get a job, you need to pay your bills. And she was within that sort of context, you know, and um, I took her under my wing. Um, I gave her a role, she was working with me, you know, and we had like a whole plan of how we were gonna build her up, right? And then life happened, right? I made a choice to leave the organization, right? And it, was, it wasn't, I'd, I hadn't been working with her for a long time. And I remember at the time I was making that choice, I'm like, mm, you know, I might be betraying people, etc. You know, but I, I still decided that the best thing for me was to take on a, a new opportunity. Right. But I still had her in my life, you know. And when I left, I continued, you know, I was still in touch with her and we would talk. And she was like, oh, you know, when you've gone, you've left this gap, etc. But I continued to talk to her to say, you know, but you have such potential and you can do so much, you know. And... What was interesting for me is because I guess I had done a good, such a good job of selling her potential to her, she quit, okay. right? So she quit that job and then I started feeling guilty and I'm like, oh my goodness, what is she going to do now, you know? But what came out of that was that she decided this is not making use of my talents. Let me distance myself actually put myself into a headspace of if this person believes I have so much to offer, if I could do anything, what would I do, right? And she actually wanted to be an entrepreneur. She wrote a business plan. She entered a competition. She won right. that competition. 
she got seed funding for her business, which she's currently running, and she's now most recently uh, applying to be on the Obama Fellowship wow. for the Leadership Acceleration. Gee. You know, and, and for me, I mean, that was just, it was such an incredible story because um, when I spoke to her, part of her feedback to me is that when she looked at me, and in her mind, she thought of me as accomplished, right? And she said, if that person thinks I have so much greatness in me, why am I doing this job? You know, that is not great. I should actually push myself to do something as wild as the way this person seems to believe in me. And she actually did. And, and now she's establishing her business, you know, and it's definitely on the way up. So okay. for me, I mean, that was incredible because my mentorship stance, right, is never about, I never took the long-term view of what are we working on? What are the conversations? That's never the big campus for me. The, the big thing for me is in every mentorship conversation that I have with someone who sees me as a mentor, how can I be present to them and fully present, right? And in that moment, you know, whatever happened in those discussions when I was being present to her and to the potential I saw in her and the hunger, it then transpired that that helped to give her the confidence to actually step out, right. right? Because I didn't give her workshops, I didn't give her here's business strategy, one-on-one, -on -one, et cetera. I mean, over the course, we would have conversations about her business idea, et cetera, and I would, I would, I would give her my input. But that, for me, I think that has been my, the standout thing about my mentorship is an ability to inject belief, right. confidence, you know, into mm. people and help them step into the greatness that is already within them okay. right because that's what holds a lot of people back actually Absolutely. it's it's just that fear of it might not work mm -hmm. right but i always try to put what if it does mm -hmm. you know what are you robbing the world of right imagine if you know we'd never tried to get to the moon mm -hmm. we'd have no cell phones exactly. right like that moonshot spawned all this technology we're enjoying mm -hmm. today that was all from going to the moon mm -hmm. but imagine if there was no moonshot Right, and I try to always instill in the people who I come across is you are a moonshot, right? Right, and all you need to do is leap. leap. <laughs> now, Togo, are there any role models of leadership that you would advise future leaders to learn and maybe study? That's always a tough question, you mm. know, because I don't. I think the I've certainly admired lots of different leaders that are either historical figures or political leaders or academic leaders or business leaders. The one lesson I always try to impart on people is never focus on the person, focus on the quality, right? For two reasons. The first one is no one is perfect. Right? Even some of the greatest leaders of our time, even the ones that are universally revered as leaders, like Nelson Mandela, right? They also had aspects of their character that were difficult, right? And sometimes if you focus too much on the person, you lose the value of the quality, right? So for me, I firmly believe leadership is universal, right? And the best leaders have been purposeful about living those universal qualities consistently. You know, because true leadership, inspirational leadership, right, it's, it's empathetic, right? Leadership is collective. It's never about the individual. It's always about the greater good, you sure. know? Leadership is available, etc. If you take, pick a leader who is revered, right, globally, you know, whether historic, etc., you can boil all of them down to the same qualities, you know, they're congruent, what they said, you know, they're ethical, they had integrity, right? So I don't think there is a magic formula. I think it's that consistency, right? Being consistent in your commitment to living those universal leadership values. Right. Yes, and where you find people who have lived them, draw inspiration from that but focus on the value, not the person. So that when that person falls in your eyes or something happens, it doesn't make them a, oh, then they weren't a great leader. 
you just discovered something else about them right. that wasn't great mm. but it doesn't detract from the aspects of them that were great mm. that can you can still use to learn from and to inspire yourself right yeah that's my view now Togo, how can our listeners get hold of you and where can they follow you oh <laughs> <laughs> So talking about social media, right. uh, yeah, what's hilarious. So um, I, I haven't been great with social media um, and that's because people don't believe this, but I'm a little bit introverted outside of work. Really? Yes. So my social, my social persona, yeah. I'm introverted, but mm. I'm, in my small sphere of people, I'm very vibrant and all over. Um, at present, um, I'm really good on LinkedIn mm. so because I have it on my phone. And also the nature of my work means I have to be on LinkedIn because I also, you know, hunt for talent there, right. etc. But I also use it as a platform to make myself available to people who would benefit from connecting to me, whether it's intellectual, they want me to read the paper, give them an opinion. Right. So LinkedIn um, is very good for me. I am going to be um, a lot more structured around uh, Facebook. So Facebook for me has been private. Yeah, so I, I have just my friends and a few family, but I recognize uh, more recently, uh, as more data has been made available to me, that in Africa, we actually have quite an active population more on Facebook, even more than LinkedIn in some countries, right? And, and Facebook for business, you know, and for connecting to people. So I am rethinking my Facebook profile and thinking of creating a professional one where I can interact with people you know also from a, almost like with LinkedIn but right. but on Facebook um, I'm terrible on Instagram <laughs> or or on Twitter um, but I think yeah I think the most consistent way of getting in touch with me and connecting particularly for the purposes of um, work or the things that matter to me you know Africa education healthcare right. financial inclusion etc and LinkedIn is probably the the, best the most effective way, exactly, the best platform to interact okay. with me. Now, Togo, last but not least, is there one piece of advice that you would really like to convey to future leaders that they should implement in their own lives? Yes. I guess my, my advice would be If there's something mm. that you want to do with your life mm. and there's someone who's already done it, you're not looking deep enough inside yourself. Mm. That would be my advice. Mm. Is I think everyone has the potential yeah. to do something exceptional right. in the world. You don't always need resources, you know, as we traditionally understand them. You don't always need connections, etc. I just think you need to find your unique contribution right. and make it and garner the people around you, the support system to make it happen. But I don't think our current generation, and I include myself in it, I don't think we're being bold enough in what we're dreaming. I don't think we're being bold enough for our own um, accomplishments. You know, and, and every time we fail to do that, you know, we fail to honor our gifts, right. you know, and the contributions that are living inside of us. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm pro abundance, right? Inside each, everyone, as I look at you, yeah. right, you have to die empty yeah. of all your possibility, yeah. right? And I challenge you, even as you go to bed tonight, think, yeah. you know, have you lived up to everything that you have to offer? And answer is no, right? And the next day, do more. And the day after that, do more. That would be my advice. Well, Togo, thank you so much for sharing your insights and your wisdom into the future and for challenging us to dig deeper. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.